right now, there are quite a few of us around the world, in fact, a lot in industry, that are talking about the climate impact of the information, communication, technology industries, ICT industries. Uh, globally, we're about um, the same as the aviation industry in terms of the amount of CO2 emission to run and cool our electronics. Um, Is that including servers and clients? It includes the backbone of the internet, all the routers, the cell phone towers, the uh, cable networks, all of the PCs, all of the servers, all of the cell phones. Now the thing that's interesting, you mentioned a supercomputer. Well, let's just take all data centers. That's where all the work is being done. Uh, in the SMART 2020 report that came out from an industry uh, consortium trying to understand what greenhouse gas emissions would look like in 2020 from the ICT industry, um, it turns out that only about a quarter of the emissions are from all the data centers, all the Google servers, uh, all the supercomputer centers in the world. Two-thirds of the emissions are from PCs and peripherals like printers. And yeah. you say, how can that be? I'm a little PC. I can't be doing what those big evil supercomputers are doing. Well, it's numbers. By 2020, there'll be four billion PCs. Now, even if we think Google has a million servers, no one knows for sure. That's a thousand times less number. Now, yes, the servers are more energy intensive than the PCs, but it's, it's, it's people is the problem. You know, between now, if we, could, if we would just not add 50% more humans to the planet by 2050 than are currently on it, we might have a chance. But given that we're doing that and not slowing down in many countries, uh, the birth rate, uh, then how, how can we innovate quickly enough to not only undo the damage we're doing with the existing world, but then adding 50% more of it by 2050? That even though humans are able to read about a subject, uh, they have experts that are saying, look, we're moving in this direction and it's going to be a big change from where we are now and so that's going to enable us to do things in a very different way. Whether it's a resistance to change, a failure of imagination, I don't know. But it's been recurring over and over and over again. When we first developed uh, an open academic supercomputing center over 20 years ago, uh, it was hard to find scientists in academia who could say what this would be good for. Now, there were some who were the early adopters, but the broad masses didn't. I've been working now on super networks for 10 years. Uh, even today, I'm still getting people saying, well, what, how could you possibly keep uh, a network a thousand times the bandwidth of the, of the shared internet um, full, I mean, and particularly to an individual, what in the world could you possibly do? In spite of the fact that we've had dozens and dozens of examples from countries all over the world that are tied together and on a daily basis are using these in a very productive way. And then finally, like I say, the thing that is most frustrating to me right now and ultimately the most dangerous is our inability to understand how we are terraforming planet Earth by this continued rise in uh, the emission of greenhouse gases into a finite planet. Uh, and the, it's not like the, you know, the scientists don't know it, they didn't get the Nobel Prize, they haven't seen Al Gore's movie, it's, it's, they don't read the latest issues of science and nature. I mean, just, just the facts ought to scare people into rethinking their action. But there's a way of just saying, well, I mean, just look at the G8 meeting that just happened. Uh, Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, went to India. India is not about to slow down their development just because, you know, it's going to add more greenhouse gas. It's not that they don't know, but there's somehow this headlong momentum. And it can't imagine that the way we're doing things will ever change. I mean, I suspect, although I don't know, that if you went back to 1900, 
and you talk to the blacksmiths and the buggy whip manufacturers and all the folks who were taking care of the millions of horses that people were riding around, they could not imagine that in a very short period of time their industries would fail to exist or would be reduced by an enormous amount. Now, innovation is our only hope and global innovation is our only hope. If you actually look at the numbers between now and 2050 in terms of the all the various sources of energy that are going to be adding pollution to the atmosphere, uh, coal in China is a very large fraction of it. So 80 percent of electricity in China is now from coal-fired plants. There are roughly a couple of several hundred megawatt coal plants being added being built in China every week. So there is a great example. Now they have tremendous amount of hydro uh, and solar power in principle and they are beginning to put long distance uh, transmission lines from say the west of China where there's a lot of hydropower, they have the Gobi Desert which you could imagine would generate more energy than they could ever use if it was harnessed with solar, but coal is cheap and plentiful and they know how to do it. And if they don't create a huge number of jobs every year, then the 800 million that are still out in the countries could become socially disruptive. So they like say, well we can't stop to change anything. We've just got to keep doing what we know how to do. And so my hope is that maybe some of these discussions that are taking place under the Obama administration now constructively between the U.S. and China could get them to the point where they could see if they could leapfrog over our old technologies to much more efficient and long-lasting technologies, that would be a great advantage to China. There are innovators now all over the world and increasingly more, most of the innovators that are coming online are outside of the United States. Uh, just because we have a fairly fixed uh, population and um, same I would say for Japan, Germany, those are declining populations. Uh, if it wasn't for immigration, we'd probably be declining in the U.S. So as the newfound uh, prosperity in India, China, uh, Eastern Europe uh, begin to happen, a lot of the new ideas are there. And yet they're separated by these huge distances from uh, say the United States and so one of the hopes is that by making it a lower barrier to discussions if you have to get I'm, I'm going to get on a plane in about a week and a half and go to Australia uh, in fact to Tasmania I'll be on that plane for 18 hours right I mean this is a pretty major investment to make just to get somewhere and talk to people um, and so again I think it's we're, we know how to do that, and we're doing more of the same. There is clearly this new way that you could do it, and that will gradually become more and more common. And I think actually cell phones will be a big driver, because very soon you're going to be able to do video from your cell phone, and, you're, and the old-time Dick Tracy a video rich watch will be real. Together. But we do this all the time at Cal IT too, so we'll have a, a, a workshop and there's a speaker who can't get a visa you know, from China or uh, has a problem uh, getting here from Europe. And uh, they just give their talk from where they are. And they put their PowerPoints and they interact with the audience. Uh, we actually had a set up with uh, President Kalam, the form former president of India, to give a uh, half hour lecture on the convergence of IT, nano, and bio and its influence on the future of India. Uh, and then went into great details and questions and answers with the audience on the efficiencies of solar cells and so forth. This is the president of India. That's